uh, welcome everyone uh, to the last talk in this uh, track. Happy that you are still around. Um, we will talk about native graph algorithms in Rust today. And uh, I am Martin and I'm here with Paul. And we are both uh, software engineers at NeoBJ working in the uh, graph data science uh, team. And so why do we talk about graph algorithms in Rust uh, since uh, GDS, for example, is written in Java? So first of all, uh, Rust is a very popular systems programming language, and it has some uh, really nice benefits compared to other languages. So for example, if you are coming from C, C++, you will really like the memory safety aspects. If you uh, come from Java, for example, you will appreciate the uh, modern uh, type system, which is way more expressive than the one in Java. And of course, uh, Rust has also a very nice out-of-the-box performance. Um, the two of us, we work in the in the engine group of the graph data science teams, which means that we focus on the in-memory graph representation and the data structures uh, that make algorithms fast. So we have like a, an eye for performance and uh, focus on that. So it's kind of uh, natural to be kind of interested in in these more lower level things like systems programming languages. So and we asked ourselves like. How would actually a library look uh, in Rust that supports like graph algorithms that can run on billions of nodes and relationships? And uh, the nice side effect of this project is that also like things we uh, found out in, in Rust, for example, the single source shortest path implementation uh, also influenced the Neo4j graph data science product because we ported it over uh, to Java after figuring out uh, how to make it uh, extremely fast. Um, so in this talk, we will start with a short overview of the Rust language. Then we will talk about the graph project itself. We will do some demos and conclude with uh, lessons learned and outlook. The Q&A will be in the chat afterwards. Over to Paul. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so Rust, a uh, programming language empowering everyone to build reliable and efficient software. Uh, what's, what does it mean for us? And especially coming from a Java point of view, like Martin said, we uh, work mostly with Java uh, here at Neo4j. So uh, Rust is a statically typed programming language, a uh, strong and sophisticated type system. Uh, mostly you write uh, in the imperative style. There is some functional aspects to it, some object-oriented as well. Um, it compiles directly to machine code, not to bytecode or anything, um, which also means that it's dependent on your architecture and your system. And there is no runtime, no Java runtime environment equivalent or anything. And um, that, of course, means also no garbage collector. And uh, it's on one side a good thing, a good thing because it um, means no uh, latency, no memory overhead, and things like that. Um, but there's other things that the uh, runtime gives us, like uh, um, compacting memory, compressed pointers. Uh, able to do runtime reflection or dynamic loading, things that are uh, either not possible or you have to somehow manually implement them. Uh, Rust has a richer and deeper support for algebraic data types and pattern matching. Uh, we do get there with Java uh, slowly. We got uh, records now. We got sealed interfaces. Uh, we got the improved switch expression and uh, future versions and incubator features. Um, already are slowly expanding that to actually have pattern matching, but more deeply integrated in Rust, uh, which means, for example, there is no null, um, but there's an option type in that. There's, there are no exceptions, but there's a result type you would use instead. Um, there's also Cargo in the ecosystem, which is the uh, build tool and uh, dependency management tool and creates IO as the uh, centralized dependency repository. And uh, of course, there's the mascot Paris um, that you can also see on our shirts. A little bit about Cargo in detail. Um, said it's the build system and package manager. It's a de facto standard for Rust projects. And uh, what you build locally, your small compiled unit is called crate. And multiple crates together form a workspace. Uh, Cargo is there for your complete workflow from scaffolding new projects, uh, Cargo new to you know building and testing and running your uh, project and at the end publish it to create IO. And uh, just look at a little bit of syntax of Rust so you can make a little bit sense of the uh, code snippets and demonstrations that we will show later. Um, this is the obligatory hello build example. 
um, some more on like how to create a binding. Uh, we use let here, uh, let x equals 42 creates immutable binding. Uh, we can also specify types if we want. There's um, i and u integer types, which is signed and unsigned integers of 32-bit uh, or 64-bit width. Um, there's also uh, type aliases, couples of uh, varying sizes, um, f32, f64 for floating point values. Um, you can also create a vec, which is um, the Rust term for a dynamically growable list, like a Java array list. And you can create that with this kind of literal syntax. It's technically a macro, but we don't need to go into detail here. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can also see the, the type specifying with the U64 type arguments in, in angle brackets, similar to how it looks in Java. And another important thing is the slices, which is a, a sub-segment of that VEC, but it's not a copy of the data or anything. It points into the VEC storage and shares the storage. Um, it is only a, a view into the VEC. And uh, so we can create some slides from that VEC. We can read it as its own collection um, and assert on its content on this link, for example. Uh, assert E here is also a macro to you know, do assertions. And with that, back to Martin. Yeah, thank you. So uh, let's talk about the graph project, which is the main focus of uh, our presentation. So the project started uh, last year in May uh, by the two of us as uh, an experiment, like a uh, yeah, side experiment hobby project. And uh, like I said earlier, our initial motivation to, was to figure out like how fast can we get these graph algorithms uh, in Rust. And uh, we made ourselves the constraint that everything we implement, if possible, should be run in parallel, which is like creating graphs and running algorithms and, uh, and so on. And over time, we added more algorithms, more features that you will see later in the talk and API improvements. And now it's basically available for others to use. Uh, I should also say that this is not an official Neo4j product. Uh, it's open source. You can find it on GitHub. So if you have any uh, issues or if you try it out and you find issues or you want to have a feature, please uh, feel free to, to create an issue on GitHub. But there's no kind of uh, guarantee that we will accept it if you are like a Neo4j customer or, or not. Uh, both are equal. So uh, let's look at the overall architecture of the of the project. So as uh, Paul mentioned earlier, the single the smallest compile unit is a crate, and we have uh, five crates in our project, which is called a workspace. And so the two crates on the bottom, graph builder and graph, contain the the graph implementation and the algorithms. Uh, both of them are published on Crates.io, uh, which Paul mentioned is the repository, similar to Maven Central, for example. Um, and GraphMate are our Python bindings uh, on top of the uh, Graph Crate. And Server and App are both uh, binary applications, and we will see, uh, we'll show how, how these work. Let's start with the uh, Graph Builder, which is at the bottom of things. And uh, it's basically an API for building directed and undirected property graphs. Let's look at an example. So we have this undirected graph on the right-hand side, uh, like five nodes with IDs. And if we want to create such a graph uh, using the, the crate, uh, we would write a Rust program like this. As you can see, uh, we have, again, the let statement, a variable G uh, and a type undirected CSR graph. Type argument here, U64, defines the node ID type that is being used when we import or when we create this graph. And the main API in this crate is the graph builder, which allows you to, for example, create a graph from a list of edges where each element is a tuple uh, representing the source and the target node of an edge. And we call build, and then we have our G, uh, which we can use to call methods like degree of a given node. For example, degree of node one is three. The neighbors of node two uh, are returned as a slice, which uh, as Paul mentioned, is just a view into the underlying data structure. It's not an array copy or anything, so it's very performant. And uh, now the question comes up, like how do we change this to a directed graph? And this is where the type system uh, comes into play. What we do here, we simply change the type that we want to produce to directed CSR graph. Uh, everything else stays the same, and the resulting graph that is being built is directed, uh, which is being controlled within the graph builder. We also change the methods that are available on directed graphs, which are out and in degree, 
how it enables, uh, but the return type is similar, like a slice of target IDs or the degree of the particular node. If you want to add uh, node properties, uh, it's very simple to do. You just add another type argument to the type that we specify here, which is U32, an unsigned 32-bit integer. And we specify the values as an extra method for the graph builder, which just takes a, a list of uh, node values indexed by the node ID from 0 to node count minus 1. And then you can access those values by using the node value functions. Uh, similar to node values, we support relationship properties. Uh, here we just use an F32, which is a float, 32 bit float value. And instead of uh, just supplying a tuple of source and target, we, you need to supply a triple, which uh, contains also the relationship weight. A uh, directed CSR graph with a relationship weight also has an additional method, which is out neighbors with values which not only gives you a slice of the target IDs, but a slice of target uh, uh, wrapper structs um, that just have the target ID and the relationship uh, property. And there's also a convenience method, uh, which is called a GDL string. So GDL is also a crate that we wrote, which is basically a Cypher create syntax, which allows you to, to write the same graph as you know it from Cypher and create a directed graph from, from this input. This is usually recommended for, for usage in, uh, in tests or in uh, POCs, whereas the, uh, the previous one with the edge list can also be used if you want to run this in parallel. OK, as you can uh, see, we can create graphs programmatically, um, but we also have a trait, like an interface in, in our project, which is called graph input, which defines um, how you can read a graph from kind of any input. We have uh, three different input implementations available, uh, but you can also add your own. Uh, the simplest one is edge list, which is basically a text file where each uh, line in the file contains a source target and an optional property um, triplet that we read. And Graph 500 is a benchmark framework, which is very common in the HPC world for graph benchmarks. And they also have a graph generator that we use for, um, for our benchmarks. Uh, which creates a binary file that you can read directly into the graph builder crate using the graph builder API. And serialized is our own format. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, the constraint is that everything that can run in parallel should run in parallel. And uh, what we do here is mainly using the rayon crate, which is the de facto standard crate in Rust to do data parallelism. And we use it both for creating graphs and for running graph algorithms. What's the internal data structure? Uh, there's nothing fancy about this. It's a very common thing that we use here. It's a CSR representation, compressed sparse row, which you typically use for sparse graphs. It mainly consists of uh, two arrays to represent the topology. The first one are the offsets, uh, which has a size of node count plus one, and the target array, which has the size of the number of edges in your graph. And if you, for example, want to figure out what are the neighbors of uh, node ID 1, uh, which are 2 and 3, we simply look up the offsets at index 1, which is node ID. Uh, then we get a, an, another index, which points into the targets array. And at, this means at this position at index 2 in the targets array is where the adjacency list for node 1 starts. And to find out how many IDs we need to read, we basically look at the next uh, uh, entry in the offset array and then subtract the value from our value, which gives us the degree, which is 2. And so we know that we need to read two uh, IDs here, which are 2 and 3. So it's uh, very straightforward. Um, so let's go to the graph crate, which sits on top of the graph builder and uses the API to implement uh, parallel graph algorithms. We have a small set of algorithms available, which are very uh, popular and uh, most frequently used. Um, again, everything is parallelized using the rayon crate, but if you want to add new algorithms, please do so. Contributions are very welcome. So how would it look to run, for example, PageRank? Um, as we saw earlier, it's very simple to create a graph. We also use GDL here, like an input string, which looks like Cypher. And uh, we create a graph, a directed CSR graph, using um, this input. We also specify a so-called CSR layout, which is an optional um, method that you can call on the graph builder, which allows you to define the, the layout of the local adjacency list, like per node. So for example, if you want the node IDs of a, a particular adjacency list sorted, you just say so or deduplicate it, which we will see uh, later. And so once we have this graph uh, created, we can call the page rank function, 
which is part of the prelude of the graph crate. So it's available once you just import it. You also have access to the page rank, fu page rank function. It takes a reference to the graph, and we use the default config. You can also specify your own with damping factor and max iterations and all these nice things. And it re returns a triplet. We are only interested in the scores at the moment, which are the scores for uh, each node, like the page rank for each node. And we do an assertion here that whatever comes out of it is uh, equ equivalent to uh, what we expect. So that's basically how you would run page rank. So uh, the next grade is uh, GraphMate, which is um, our Python bindings for the uh, grades that Martin just talked about. And in particular, uh, we want to pose a more Pythonic API um, that is using the Rust implementation internally. So we didn't re-implement all this in Python, but it's a, uh, a an extension for Python that uses the, uh, the Rust implementation. And that also means all the memory management and parallelism is done in Rust, so we can work around the global interpreter lock and don't have to use awkward multiprocessing tools that we can offer fully parallel graph algorithms usable from Python. Uh, it integrates with NumPy and Pandas, and uh, at the moment it's quite an alpha state, so not everything that we have in our Rust API is available. But what we do have available, uh, you can pip install it from PyPI, pip install CraftMate. And uh, going through the same example, um, this is what it looks like in Python. Uh, we don't have GDL support in Python just yet, so we need to create our edges manually. Uh, we can do this by creating a NumPy array with uh, a two-dimensional array um, of uh, a UN32 type. It's uh, the only thing we support in Python right now. And then we can create a directed graph from NumPy. We also provide the sorted layout here, uh, which will build the graph. We can run page rank as a method on this uh, on the value. And uh, page rank gives us a scores method, which will return the page rank scores um, as a NumPy array as well, um, which is also a view into the direct that um, you had on an earlier slide. And since the implementation is the very same, all the scores are also, of course, identical. OK, the, the next grade is one of our binary applications. Uh, the first one is a CLI application, which we just wrote mainly for us to easily run benchmarks on, on, a, on a server, for example. So you can see that we run this with, with Cargo, uh, which is the build tool that Paul mentioned earlier with the run command. And then we have some benchmark specific arguments like where the graph is located, how many runs, warm up runs, and then the algorithm. And uh, this looks something like this. So you just type it into your CLI. Um, and this runs on scale 24, which has 700 mil 270 million relationships. And it runs uh, page rank three times and an average runtime of 2.6 seconds for, for page rank. So it's mainly for, for testing things out and seeing uh, how, how fast they are. Um, then the second binary application that we provide is the server crate, uh, which is really uh, exciting because it exposes the, the creating graphs and running algorithms to clients over a network connection. Uh, under the hood, we use Apache Arrow Flight, which is a gRPC-based framework with lots of uh, implementations for client languages like Java, Python, C++, Rust, and so on. And so the server also provides a graph catalog, uh, similar to Graph Data Science, uh, which allows you to manage multiple named graphs on the server side. Um, there are graph building features. So you can, for example, stream an edge list from a client to the server and then create named graphs in the catalog on the server side. Uh, you can also uh, instruct the server to create a graph from, from, a, from an input that is locally accessible to the server. So if the file is already on the server, you can just send the so-called create action, which we'll see later in the demo. And then we have the uh, graph compute features, uh, which of course, allow you to run algorithms by sending a compute action, which contains like the, the, the graph name you want to run on and the algorithm you want to run and its uh, parameters. And the uh, results are stored under user defined key, which is similar to the mutate mode in graph data science, if you're familiar with the library. Um, so, and then you can use that user defined key to stream the results back to the client, uh, which is uh, very convenient. So you start the server, now the, the client requests something, there's a create action, 
uh, done creating graph, a compute action for page rank, page rank is being computed, and then the results are streamed back uh, to the client. This brings us to the demo session. Um, and we will use the same demo for, for each kind of scenario that we want to show. Uh, we will use the graph 100 data set scale 24, which has 270 million relationships. It's a power law graph. And in the demo, we will start by direct, uh, creating a directed graph from, from the Graph 500 file, compute page rank and WCC. And then in order to run triangle count, we need to convert the graph into an undirected graph. And we also use an optional optimization, which is called relabeling um, to make triangle count faster. And we'll show this with all three available APIs, basically, starting with um, the Python API. So the Python demo is uh, written in a Python notebook and um, just run everything so we can um, talk about that while it runs. And uh, first, we prepare some logging so we can see the output, what is happening, and we import uh, all the relevant libraries that we use in this uh, demonstration, which is, of course, Crocmate as well as NumPy and Pandas. And as Marty mentioned, uh, we have the scale 24 graph uh, lying on the system, and we will create a directed graph. Uh, we use the deduplicated layout here, which means um, we are, in addition to sorting the adjacency list, we also remove any parallel edges. And as you can see in the output, it's, uh, it read the, uh, the input graph in like 0.3 seconds, um, and it's building the outgoing CSR in three seconds. The incoming CSR 3.5 seconds. So overall, it's like seven-ish seconds uh, to create the graph with these 60.7 uh, million nodes, 260 million edges. Um, now we can run page rank on the graph. It's just called page rank, and we get a uh, page rank result. We can see a logging about the iterations, and the page rank result gives us some properties. So we can see how many iterations run, how long it took overall. So it just ran in a, a little bit over two seconds here. And uh, PageRank also has the scores method, which returns a NumPy array. Um, but PageRank result itself um, is a struct that contains the uh, vector of the scores um, in its memory representation. And the NumPy array is, is a view into this memory. It's not a copy. Uh, you cannot change the values here, but you can read them. You can put them into a data frame. Uh, which we do here. And with that data frame, uh, we can do some uh, analysis on this data. So we can print the size, which is, of course, uh, our node count. And we can print, uh, calculate and print the minimum, maximum, mean, and median uh, patron scores, which we can see here. Now, uh, the next thing we want to do is run WCC or uh, weekly connected components. Uh, similar to page rank, we call a WCC method and get a WCC result, uh, which also gives us access to how long it took. Um, we get some outputs. In, in this example, it took about 150 milliseconds to calculate WCC. And similar to page rank result, we get a components method, which also returns us a NumPy array view of the actual data. And the actual data is for every node, um, it's its component ID. Um, so we have node count size entries, but since uh, nodes belong to the same component ID, they have the same component ID value. So we are dropping every duplicate. Um, and this will give us uh, all the unique components that are in the graph. Um, in this example, it's 7.9 million unique components. And then next, we want to calculate the total triangle count. And for this, we have to convert the graph into an undirected graph first. Uh, there's a two undirected method, which also accepts uh, optional layout here. We want to keep the deduplicated de de layout. Um, and it runs through, uh, it's basically using the existing graph as in the graph input for a new graph. And uh, so this runs in about four seconds. And the new graph is, uh, is a completely new graph. It doesn't share anything with the old graph. So we can remove the old graph if we want to clean up some memory. And here is the relabel optimization that Martin mentioned, uh, where the API is uh, make degree ordered. It changes the graph in place, um, so it doesn't return anything. Uh, it's about one second to relabel it, and then we can call global triangle count. 
which gets us also a triangle count result with a triangle property, um, the micro property, and it's it is pure living accident, of course, ran in 42 seconds. What an accident. And uh, we counted the 10 billion triangles. Uh, okay. Cool. Uh, thanks. Uh, so the next demo, we will show the same scenario using the uh, the Rust API directly. Uh, so I switch to the terminal. So what I'm having in this uh, terminal here is just a program that I want to execute, which is the same as uh, all just did. Um, and while this is running, we can go through the code on the on the left hand side. Um, so we also start like we have a main method here, and we start with um, creating a directed graph uh, with U64 IDs, uh, also from the scale 24 graph. Uh, we run PageRank. I only wrap this call into a time function to to measure how long it takes, but it also returns the the scores, which is basically a vector of uh, F32s. Um, which Paul explained earlier are uh, the 32-bit the, the floating point, and the vector is this uh, growable data structure. Uh, then we don't have pandas in Rust, but we have polars. <laughs> uh, so it's also a data frame API, and we use it um, to, to wrap our results into a data frame to do the same um, computations that we showed in the notebook. Um, then we run a WCC, a particular implementation, AF Forest, which is a, a nice optimization for uh, undirected graphs um, and direct graphs. And we also create, uh, we get the component spec, which is essentially a vector of U64, where uh, the, the value is basically the component ID for each node in the vector. We also create a data frame um, of that, uh, do the unique call to figure out how many components there are. Um, we turn the graph into an undirected graph, which, as Paul said, uh, returns a completely new graph. Uh, we can also drop the old graph if we are uh, uh, if we want to like, release the memory early. Um, we change it to uh, do the relabeling in the same API, and we run the global trying account. And uh, on this right hand side, you see the you see the output, which is of course very similar. We read the edges, um, run page rank. This is the output of polars for these data frames for the metrics for the page ranks. Um, WCC runs here with the same component count of roughly uh, 8 million, uh, 180 milliseconds, uh, relabeling and trying account in the end with also around 10 billion triangles. There's a bonus question here. So it takes a bit longer than in the Python example. And if you find out why in the chat, then you will get something. I don't know yet what, but we'll see. Um, and a hint, it's not because Python is faster than Rust, um, but maybe you can figure it out. Okay, uh, so the next demo or the last demo is the same example, but using uh, the server crate in combination with uh, PyArrow as the uh, as the client. Um, as I said earlier, we have um, there are multiple client implementations for for uh, Apache Arrow. We use the the Python one because it's very simple to demonstrate things. Um, in this terminal, I will just start the server. So the server is now started and uh, listening on local host. And I will execute the script that I'm now going through on the left-hand side. So there's a main function which basically initializes the um, the client um, by giving it the location, and then using that client, we will start by, for example, creating the graph, um, which means we create the so-called create action that I mentioned earlier, which is essentially a, a dictionary which we turn into a JSON document, which contains all the information that the server needs to create the graph, like a name, where the graph is located, and also these layout uh, parameters. And uh, once this is done, we can uh, also list the graphs, like uh, showing all the graphs in the catalog. But let's look at how to run, for example, PageRank. Uh, PageRank has uh, also a configuration with uh, max iterations, damping factor, and so on. And we use this uh, dictionary to wrap it into uh, a compute action, which is again like a, a dictionary which we turn into a JSON document, which tells the server on which graph we want to run the algorithm, what is the actual algorithm, and what is the property key under which the server should store the result. Um, and then we can load this property by, by using the so-called ticket, which is arrow lingua for this is something I have, and I want to get the information associated with that ticket, which is the, the property values, the result of the algorithm. 
which essentially uh, just uses the client to do a GET request to the server, uh, tell it the ticket, and the server will respond with a stream containing all the data associated with that particular ticket. The rest is the same. We run WCC, uh, we turn the graph into undirected, to relabeled, uh, run triangle count, and so on. And what we can see on the right hand side is basically the output on the server where it receives the create action, which is where we started. Uh, it's done creating it's done creating the graph. It also returns the create action result, which you can see here. It's also uh, printed by the client. So here's the, the client output. Um, so it created the graph uh, in eight seconds, roughly. Then it lists all the graphs, which is uh, the list action here, and um, which tells us all the graphs in the catalog. We run page rank, we get the result back and the information on where to uh, get the, the, the values from, uh, under which ticket. We load the values, um, so we stream from the server to the client by asking for uh, the particular page rank values. This is on the same machine, so it's uh, pretty quick. Um, and then we print the stats using the same uh, pandas uh, statistics that we use in the IPython notebook. And um, yeah, that's mainly it. So let's go to lessons learned. Ah, sorry. Okay, uh, so what have you learned from all of this? Uh, well, first thing, uh, especially coming from a Java and JVM perspective, uh, that Rust is definitely a different language. It has different paradigms, so it's not just about uh, doing things in Java and then translating the syntax to Rust. We have to rethink uh, the Rust way, which uh, also results in different design and APIs. Uh, but it also brings us closer to um, the mechanical sympathy, sympathy which is um, a better understanding on what actually happens on hardware level and uh, bringing what you do closer to what actually happens on hardware level. And it's, um, it definitely improves when working with Rust. Uh, more of a systems programming language as well. Um, on the other hand, uh, there's a different ecosystem. Uh, we have uh, Cargo as a different build tool experience. We have uh, Rust Analyzer, which is a language server protocol. Um, Martin showed his demo in uh, Helix, a terminal editor, which uh, integrates with MSPs. Uh, so you got a different IDE integration and setup uh, compared to what we know from the JVM. And this is true for uh, debuggers and profilers as well. Uh, everything that we learn from how to debug and profile and do things from the JVM is not really applicable because it's not on the JVM. So um, there are different tools and we have to relearn them to be, uh, uh, acquire skills to deal with those tools. Um, but what about the performance? Uh, we talked about um, that we wanted to build uh, performant applications. And for everything that we have in Rust, where we also have a Java equivalent, uh, Rust was better in all cases. Um, and uh, one important aspect is the predictable runtime behavior, which is in one part due to not having the runtime, not having garbage collection latency spikes, um, but also being compiled ahead of time with a uh, VM backend, which has a lot of optimizations baked in. And there is no phase where at some point the bit compiler will kick in and make things fast. They are as fast as they are from the beginning. And it's not a, it doesn't fluctuate that much. And let's look a little bit into the future. Um, what do we want to do next? Of course, we want to add more algorithms on the APIs. Um, and we also want to uh, play around with an algorithm framework that would allow you to write your own algos, uh, thinking like something like Breaker, for example. Um, we want to explore what we can do with native capabilities even more since we are more closer to the hardware, uh, which means things like SIMD or maybe integrating with uh, TensorFlow or similar libraries. Also want to look into integrating with GPUs as well. And so for now, uh, the library is certainly usable, but not really battle tested. And what we want from you or need from you um, is, of course, feedback. So if you happen to be able to play around with this, uh, please any issues and give us feedback. Um, also, we are very glad to accept any contributions. And if you are a Neo4j user or customer and you're considering using this, then please uh, let us know and reach out. Uh, yeah, and that's it for our talk. Uh, thank you.
All right, guys. Thank you so much for your talk. So interesting. Well, we had a little bit of discussion here in, in, in the chat about how many cores were you running this on? Was it like... I, I yeah, that's, uh, that's my uh, desktop. It's a, it's a Ryzen 3950X with uh, 16 physical cores and 32 threads. All right, so they're hyper-threaded threads, uh, hyper-threaded yes. threads. Yeah, that's, yes. that's the word. <laughs> well, great talk, guys. Um, so we have we have some some other questions here, um, and uh, so, so we have one here from NM. Are you are you going to drop Java in favor of Rust for Nifi J after this park? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, no comment. <laughs> no comment. Uh, probably All not. Right. Right. Um, the, the goal no, is not. I, I'm, I'm guessing that's not really a serious question, but yeah. um, um, I would love to see uh, maybe uh, like a mini version of Neo4j, maybe in, in written in Rust or something like that. That would be fun to see. Um, all right, we have another question here from Hoakian. Um, uh, can I use arrows to pull data from Neo4j into this? Uh, yeah, you certainly can. Uh, we actually also have a demo for that, but no time today to show it. But uh, reach out if you want to have more details. All right. All right. That's perfect. Um, here's another question for uh, NM. So which use case do you see uh, for Neo4j? This, use this for Neo4j users. Right, so the main the main uh, use case is basically if performance really matters, like the implementations in uh, the graph data science library, especially the ones that we mirror in in in, in the graph grade, like PageRank, WCC, they're already super fast. And uh, mm -hmm. but if there are customers uh, who want to go a step further in terms of performance, this is certainly an option. Um, also, there are like Paul said, we want to look into more uh experiments that uh, where we can leverage the the underlying hardware in a better way because that's something you cannot really do in in java in the same way so for example vectorization that paul mentioned um so that's something if you want to get the, the the last kind of percent of performance out of it that could certainly be a scenario also for like these uh, kind of service architectures where you need to s spawn like uh, something very quickly you have this binary pre-compiled and it just runs um, without like any warm-up performance or anything. It just runs and delivers the performance that you want, which is also really nice compared to uh, uh, the standard JVM. Not talking about Kral here, but um, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. yeah. That's, that's perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you guys here and listening to your talk. Um, yeah, thank you. And I think that wraps it up for uh, today.